But tonight, I'm pleased to announce and present someone I've known for quite a few years now, it seems like, Megan Pleat Postal. <laughs> she is a history buff, which makes her a fan of mine, but she's also a journalist who writes for, you may know in the Rome Daily Sentinel, Boonville Herald, New York Outdoor News, and a magazine called In Good Health. So we're pleased to have Megan here tonight with us. I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna mute my microphone and turn my camera off and stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Free Postal. Thank you, Patrick, for having me here. Thank you for the um, opportunity to talk about Remsen, because anybody who knows me knows I'm like Mrs. Remsen. I love talking about it. And sometimes you can't shut me up about it. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making the time. Um, the photos that we're going to look at tonight are from the book um, Around Remsen and Stu Ben. I do also have another book in print called um, Southern Adirondack Foothills Fishing, Hunting, and Trapping. Um, those are both published by Arcadia. And um, the images from tonight, most of them come from the collection of Jeanette Walters. Others come from the collection of Linda Bailey. And then some are just from my personal family's collection. So I'm going to share the screen here. Patrick, let me know if I'm messing this up. Yep. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> are we good? There you go. Okay. So I'm just okay. Fabulous. I'm just gonna kind of jump right in. So the uh, the book we're gonna talk about tonight is around Remsen and Stu Ben, like I already stated. And what I figured I would do is I'll give a little bit of background about the history of Remsen, and then I selected some of my favorite images from the book, and I'll share a tidbit of history about each image as we go through. And then at the end, if you guys have questions, we can discuss the questions. So talking about Remsen and Stuben would be completely incomplete if you didn't talk about Baron von Stuben, or as I like to always sneak in his entire name, is Frederick Wilhelm August Heinrich Ferdinand Stuben. Say that 10 times fast. Stuben came from um, Prussia. He was Prussian. And he, um, I'm sure a lot of people already know about Stuben if you're interested in the history of Remsen, but I'm going to just skim on it because it's important. He was a drill master of the revolution. That's his claim to fame. He was a Prussian soldier who later became an mil American military officer, and he kind of whipped the American Revolutionary Army into shape, helped us win, and for his contribution to the Revolutionary Army, he was awarded 16,000 acres in upstate New York, which is Stuben. He summered there with his aide in a two-room cabin on Star Hill. The way that Stuben settled his property was his aide, Benjamin Walker, was stationed um, in New York City. And Walker would send Welsh immigrants up to Stuben to um, work the land and lease the property. And in that way, Stuben and then the Remsen area became mostly Welsh. Stuben died there in 1794, and when he died, he requested an unmarked grave, which was not granted. He was, um, he was, it was granted originally, but then later it was like revoked and his remains were transferred to the sacred grove, which is still there and you can visit it. That property is owned by the National um, Park. So this image here, this is an undated image of the village of Remsen, which is um, called Remsen City. But even though it's undated, we can trace it to some time between the 1920s and the 1960s because you can see the Dairyman's League, which is the giant um, plant in the upper, the background of the image. One of my favorite things about this image in particular as you can see the Cincinnati Creek to the left of the image kind of winding through the village. And then in the foreground, you can see Stuben Street where it comes to meet Main Street. And then you can see the town park, which is still in use. It looks very much like this, except for obviously it's got playground equipment and bleachers and whatnot to the right of the image. 
And one of the nice things you can see about this image that we'll learn more about later is you can see on the corner of Main and Steuben Street, the Pierce House, which is still standing. So the Pierce House. The Pierce House, also called the Millgate House, the Zions Hotel or Hotel Edward, was built in 1814. And it had various owners throughout the years, but its purpose was always the same. It was a boarding house for travelers or um, people who needed a room. They sold dinners. At one time, they were famous for their chicken and steak dinners. It was owned by um, Edward Milgate, Edward Dine, and then other owners throughout the years. Now, if you were to visit or to drive by the Pierce House, you wouldn't really recognize it because the wraparound porch is gone, and the upper porch is gone, and the back building is gone. It's currently a rental unit. This image here is from the Brenton Post Office when it existed in the lower business district of Main Street in Remsen. The postmaster here in this image is O.J. Griffith, and he was a postmaster from 1921 to 1934. His post worker is Helen Rowland, the wife of William Rowland. And the post office operated in this location until 1960 when it was moved to a new location on Upper Stuben Street. The Bristol House is the same building that appears, the different image, but it's the same building that appears on the cover of the Remsen and Stuben book. The Bristol House was kind of a main community gathering place in Remsen for many, many years. It was located on the corner of Main and Prospect Street. It's not there anymore, and a lot of people get, if they're just casually driving through Remsen, they get the Bristol House confused with the apartment building house that's located a block north on Depot Street and Main Street, because they do look very, very similar. Even the little um, bump out window is like exactly the same, but it's not the same structure. The Bristol House was built in 1814 by Dr. Earl Bill, and it had a few different owners throughout the year and a few different purposes. So after Dr. Earl Bill built it, he used it as a boarding house and had businesses downstairs. He sold it to Jacob Lewis, who was one of the most famous proprietors of this location. They called him Uncle Jack, and he was known for his really outlandish kind of tall tales he would tell travelers and visitors and um he would have really big parties and kind of he was a lively guy a big larger than life kind of guy jacob lewis or uncle jack sold it to george dawson who then later sold it to friend bristol friend bristol owned the property for a long time and that's how it got the name the bristol house after fred friend Bristol sold the property. It, the name still stuck. He sold it to Frank Gainsway, which is a, a big family name in Ramson, or at least it was at one time. Frank Gainsway operated it till 1947 when he sold it to Orville Davis. Davis owned the property until 1977. January 1977, when it burned to the ground, unfortunately. There are still images of the um, the Rumpton Hotel fire, which is the Bristol House, that you can still find. I think maybe the other book on um, Rumpton, uh, Rumpton by um, Pat Hill might have an image of that book, that fire. So the Bristol House, some of the purposes of this building was a community hall. There were church suppers hold, held here. There was voting held here. There were dinner theaters, dinner operas, uh, ballroom dancing upstairs. It was a big gathering place. In 1905, the third district Republican convention was held here. Um, when it burned, it was being used as 
apartments upstairs and then businesses downstairs. Some of the businesses that it held when it burned were the barber shop, the beauty shop, an electrical store, the victory store, and a laundromat. There might be more. Right now, it's just that area there is a parking lot with a old super duper. So the Dairyman's League. The Dairyman's League was built in the 1920s. And the reason that the Dairyman's League plant was built was in response to the New York um, dairy farmers frustration with being able to market their milk. They wanted more opportunity to get their milk um, from farm to consumer. So the Dairyman's League was built as part of a large co-op of different Dairyman's Leagues across the, country, across the state. Um, this plant in particular employed hundreds of people. It was a, one of the most robust employers in the village. It operated from 19, in the 1920s and then it closed in the 1960s. When it closed, that was one of the most devastating um, instances for the village of Rumson as far as losing uh, businesses. Many people lost their jobs. This plant had a daily capacity of 225,000 uh, pounds of milk. One of my favorite things about these pictures on the right is on the upper background, on the upper right side of the right image, you can see the old uh, railroad turnaround, the turntable, which I thought was kind of cool. The Dairyman's League still stands and it's currently um, an apartment complex. If you're familiar with Rumson, it's located behind the soda fountain and general store building. This image here is pretty interesting because, for a few reasons actually. So we've got a residence on the left, the old Baptist church building in the middle, and then the tannery and the shoe factory on the right side. If you were to drive by this street, this is Main Street, we're looking from um, the corner of Main and Prospect Street. There's traffic on this corner that you can see, and it's funny because to picture Remsen ever being busy enough to have a traffic light, wild. And um, this traffic light doesn't exist there anymore, which also doesn't exist in this location anymore is the um, building, the home to the left. That structure is removed and in its place is the fire station, which was built in 1965. The other two structures in this building, the Baptist Church building and then the Tannery Shoe Factory, those are still standing. The Baptist Church is now the Rumson Performance Arts Center. At one time, it was a lively congregation, but, and it was, um, let's see, this structure here was built in 1893 and it operated for a very long time, but eventually it had to close because the congregation got so small that it could not sustain the church. So this, the Baptist church closed and it sat empty for a number of years until 2011 when a group of dedicated locals um, came together to form the Remsen Performing Visual Arts Center. And they hosted a number of events and community um, theaters, talent shows, weddings, parties, that kind of thing um, in this location. A lot of the interior, even the exterior, but a lot of the interior of the Remsen Performing Visual Arts Center is the same. The chandelier is not there and um, some of the things are a little bit updated, but overwhelmingly it's very much intact and it's a beautiful building. If you ever get a chance to go to an event at this art center, I would definitely recommend you go because even just to go there and just to look at the structure, is it's worth it. The Dennis Thomas Library. So the Dennis Thomas Library, was built from money bequested from um, Marion, his daughter, his daughter was Lydia, 
his wife Lydia, and she wanted a, a library structure that was in memory of her father because her father was um, a man that had a, a really strong work ethic. He had a really high reputation. He had come from just, he was just a farm boy. He was born in Stupen to Welsh immigrant parents, not wealthy folk. And while growing up, good Miss Thomas worked on farms, did whatever he had to do to contribute to the family. He um, became educated. His first real job was a school teacher. And then after being a school teacher, he settled into a more lucrative career as a merchandiser and he built up family wealth and he brought his family, um, he was able to have, give his family a stable life as a merchandiser. Um, a fun fact about Didymus Thomas is that his name Didymus, even though he was an only child, his name Didymus um, means twin in Greek. The Denimus Thomas Library, um, it was built in this location in 1908, but before 1908, Rampton still did have a library and operated on the first to the second floor of the E.G. Williams Drugstore, which was located in the lower business district on Main Street. The sign from the original library is on display in the Denimus Thomas Library. And one little fun fact about the Denimus Thomas Library is the front steps have recently been um, redone, but they were original up until this year. So the construction in this building is it's holding up. I mean, those steps are more than 100 years old. And the contractors who just repaired them took great pains to make them look original. So that's fantastic. This image of the Remsen High School is when the Remsen High School was located on Stupend Street. You wouldn't see this in this building anymore because right now where this building was located is the post office. This Remsen High School was only in um, use for about 25 years. It opened in 1910 and then by 1935, the new Remsen Central School building was being constructed on the north end of the building. At that time, to the growing community, and it had outgrown this um, smaller structure. So the current Ramson Central School building, current in this slide is a little bit misleading because if you were to look at it today, it's much bigger. It's a sprawling complex. There's an elementary school out back. There's an addition off to the to the left side of the school. There's many updates. Um, but the original structure of the Remsen Central School building was built in 1935. Um, this image is one of my favorites out of the book collection because you can see a lot of detail in it. And what I mean is if you look down on Main Street in the upper uh, foreground of the image, you can see the old Davis um, fuel pump. And you can see the Harley Williams homestead right there. You can see a foundation in between the homestead and the school of a barn that once stood. There's a lot to look at when you, um, if you're familiar with Ramson, even the homes to the side of the Ramson Central School building weren't built yet. There's a lot of changes that have happened since this image was taken place. I'd like to see an updated aerial view of this school, actually. It'd be interesting to compare them side by side. These two images. This is Griswold's Diner, um, also known as Jack and Harley's. Uh, Jack Griswold was the proprietor who leased the building from um, Harley Williams, owner of Williams Oil. These images were taken in 1938. This uh, building still stands, but it's, it's no longer in use. Um, one of the cool things about this little diner is that you can see that they could uh, sit on the outside and then be served their pop or their ice cream or their burgers or whatever they came to eat. Barbecue, as the sign says. 
A uh, little fun fact about Jack Griswold is he operated a couple of different diners. He operated this one here. He operated one in Lowellville. And then after this location here, there was another structure built on Route 12 after the Route 12 bypass was built in the 1950s. And he operated that too, which is um, it's now Cindy's Diner. It's located on the north on side of Route 12, right outside of Remsen. Um, right across the street, we've got the Williams Oil Service Station. My guess is these two images were taken probably on the same day by the same photographer. Uh, the Williams Oil Company was family owned from 1929 until the late 1990s. Very successful Remsen business, employed many, many people. Located on the north end of Main Street, just north of the Remsen Central School building, right before you leave the village and continue up Old State Route 12. Um, this oil company had uh, many different um, locations from what I read. They had a, a couple different um, outposts. I think Alder Creek and Remsen and a couple others. Um, when this one closed, just like the Dairyman's League, that was also a devastating thing for Remsen. It employed many people. Many people loved working here. So as all little towns, you know, as time kind of swallows them up, they lose businesses little by little. So this image is an image of the crest of the hill, 95 Hill, if you're going east on Fairchild Road from um, Remsen towards like the Hinkley Reservoir area, Northwood area. One of the, it says no lot east of 95 Hill, which is um, kind of a, it's an old local saying. So in Forest Fort, which is a town located uh, just north of Remsen, a logging town, kind of a, a rough and rumble barroom town, the saying in Forest Fort was um, no law north of Remsen, because, you know, that's where the rowdy folks hung out. But in Remsen, the local saying, was no lot east of 95 Hill because once you crested the hill and then you got closer to the Northwood area, that's where the rowdy folks of Remsen settled down. So that area was um, kind of known for its, its uh, crazier folks, for lack of a better word. On old uh, State Route 12, there was Huther's hot dog stand operated by George Huther. The location he chose for his hot dog stand was ideal at the time because it was on a main route right near the railroad crossing, the bottom of the hill. It was perfect stop, perfect place to stop and um, enjoy soda or ice cream or a snack or a treat or whatever until it wasn't, which was when the New York State Route 12 bypass was constructed and it completely went around George Huther's uh, hot dog stand, so there wouldn't be any main traffic coming, you know, maybe local traffic. One of my favorite things about this image is cold drinks on his stand is spelled out in bottle caps. This image here is of the just Keys gas station and restaurant, which is also um, the fireplace restaurant. This structure doesn't exist anymore. It was at the corner of Dayton Road and Route 12, where the current Evans equipment is located. This one was operated for many, many years before the other businesses thrown out. We're going to talk about a couple of the churches of Remsen and Subban because being from a Welsh um, foundation, the church is an important part of Remsen life and Subban life. So we're going to just touch on a couple. So the Penny Cairo Church 
was located on the corner of James Road and Francis Road, which is just outside of the village, about a mile and a half or two miles or so. Um, this church was historic because it was the first Calvinistic Methodist church in the entire United States. It was built in 1824. It doesn't stand anymore. The only thing that still stands at Penny Cairo is the marker and the cemetery. Um, but it's worth, if you ever get in, up in that area and you're interested in kind of Welsh heritage, it's worth checking out the cemetery. Um, a lot of notable names are there. It's a really interesting place to just stop and visit the marker. Chapel Ocha, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, was built in 1804 on the top of Star Hill. There's a, the cemetery also remains here for this one. The big thing about Chapel Ocha is the notable pastor. So um, abolitionist Reverend Robert Everett, he, he was a big name, the big, um, big name preacher that came out of this church. Reverend Robert Everett, um, he was very, very passionate about um, abolition. He was a printer. He was a writer. He and his son translated Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin into Welsh. They also um, printed a, a Welsh language newspaper for a number of years. They uh, shared messages of um, equality and abolition in those newspapers. His work, him and his family, his family was also involved, made central New York a, a key region for the abolitionist movement. He was involved in um, conventions at the time. He was um, he was a big a big name in the fight. So much so that he's actually being inducted into the Abolitionist Hall of Fame, which unfortunately that ceremony is, is uh, postponed a second time to 2022. But um, his work was important and a lot of it was done here. So the book is called Remsen and Stuben, but there's also a section about the Hinckley area which never made it to the title, which is not my choice, unfortunately. I wanted to call the book Remsen and the Hinkley Area, but anybody who's published um, a book that hasn't self-published or gone through a publisher knows that ultimately the publisher gets to make those little decisions. So um, I'm gonna talk about Hinkley because I have an abundance of information about it and because it made it into the book. Um, yeah, this main image here, is Main Street looking north. This none of the structures in this image are still standing, and this image dates before the dam. So one of the notable buildings in this image is the Empire House, which is the last um, big building with the double porches, the white one. The Empire House was a boarding house for uh, travelers. Um, they um, they housed the loggers, a lot of the French Canadian loggers that would transport the logs down to West Canada because before there was the Hinkley Reservoir, there was the West Canada, and Hinkley was a busy, busy, robust village along the West Canada long before the dam existed. Um, as you can see, right down the line are all boarding houses. The um, the uh, what the book? The ethnic makeup of Hinckley was primarily um, Italian, Irish, and French Canadian. And a lot of the boarding houses wouldn't um, take the French Canadians because they were so rowdy and so loud and um, fighting all the time, breaking things, whatnot. So the ones that did would make a lot, a lot of money from the French Canadians. Um, there was three districts of Hinkley. There was this district called Little Italy, which is located, was located north of where the dam was eventually built. 
that is where all the Italian immigrants settled with their families. Um, there was a section called Little Brooklyn, which is where um, is Polish, it wasn't Irish, where the Polish settled. And then there was a section for the French Canadians and if they had families. One interesting tidbit of information about the Hinkley village is that the schoolhouses wouldn't permit the children of the French Canadians to attend. They had to have their own different organized school system. So the Empire House, which I just talked about a little bit, this is a much better view of the Empire House. This image would have been taken from the original bridge crossing the West Canada Creek, heading towards what is now South Shore Road, going into Herkimer County. Um, this bridge, the structural foundation still exists, and if you cross the new bridge and you look towards the dam, you can see them. Um, you can also see in this image the railroad bed that went up through the village of Hinkley and then to north to where the dam eventually was built. You can see the crossing. Um, now, where the railroad bed was is 365, which goes up and scrolls around. You can see in this image, which also doesn't exist, some of the clearings behind the tree line, behind the village. Everything there is all blown up now. This long, long since changed the landscape of Hinkley. Um, the Empire House is long gone as well. So St. Anne's Church in Hinkley has a, an interesting backstory. So originally, the town hall in the village of Hinkley was built in a really ideal location in the village. It was on the hill overlooking the West Canada. It was centrally located right there, kind of smack dab in the center of the village. It was on a nice level area. It was a good location. And the Catholic congregation of St. Anne wanted that location. Their original location was, and they approached the town or the village hall and asked to switch locations. Their congregation was outgrowing the location they had, and they thought it would be a good logical move. But town officials refused the congregation's request. And so, not long after, um, coincidentally, maybe, uh, the original town hall burned to the ground. And um, then after the location, the town hall was just a, a burning, broken pile of rubble, finally the town seceded and uh, switched with St. Anne's congregation. And St. Anne's congregation, uh, through luck or conspiracy, ended up building their church, St. Anne's Catholic Church, in that location. They had a very, very robust Catholic congregation there for a very, very long time. And that church stayed open until, up until probably 20 years ago, 20, 2001 or two or so. And then it got absorbed by St. Uh, St. Leo's and St. Anne's Catholic Congregation located in Holland Patent. The church building still stands as does the rectory. And there's a, a small cemetery located right behind St. Anne's Church. There's also a cemetery called St. Anne's Cemetery located across 365 in a wooden um, grove. The Hinkley Mercantile. So the Hinkley Mercantile was built by um, wealthy businessmen, Hinkley and Ballou. They knew that because Hinkley was uh, starting to grow and businesses were being established there that they needed a general store. So they came together, they uh, pooled their money, and they had this built. Um, the Hinkley Mercantile doesn't stand either. Most of the structures really, not most, but a good chunk of the structures of the Hinkley Village are no longer there, either because um, they were removed or replaced for um, Route 365 when it was built, or simply because they just had burned down or deteriorated throughout the years. Photographer Howard Thomas, who a lot of his images have appeared in this slideshow and in the book already, his work documents a lot of um, 
North Country areas and structures from long ago. Howard Thomas grew up in Prospect, which is just a matter or two down the road, very, very close village. And he had a, a special uh, debacle that he always encountered at the Hinkley Mercantile that he wrote in his memoir about tennis balls. And Howard Thomas, he really liked to play tennis, but he couldn't find any tennis balls in Prospect. The only location locally that sold tennis balls was the Hinkley Mercantile. So in order to go to Hinkley and purchase his tennis balls, he would have to follow the road north to Hinkley. But always, every time, without fail, he wrote, he would be um, intercepted by a group of <sighs> territorial Hinkley youth. And there was always a brawl, he said, and more times than often, he left empty-handed and never made it to the Hinkley Mercantile because he got beat up on the way by uh, teenagers from Hinkley. This image is an image of the construction of the Hinkley Dam. Constructing the Hinkley Dam was a really big feat at the time. It was written about in the newspapers as like a monumental uh, fortress and huge plan to dam up the West Canada Creek and create a reservoir. And it actually was a really big deal at the time. Um, the vantage point we're looking at this image from is uh, south looking north to where 365 now wraps around this hill. The home in this image is, is no longer there, but it would have been part of the Little Italy district. The railroad bed is no longer here, but in the place of this is the Hinkley Dam and Route 365 and the Hinkley Reservoir. This is a different vantage point of the same time era, uh, 1912 to 1915, when Hinkley Dam was being constructed. North, looking south at the hillside and the construction of the dam and the West Canada Creek behind it. This is a better image of Little Italy. You can see quite a few um, home structures in the background. You can see a lot of, lot of work being done to start to dam up the West Canada Creek. Now the only thing that remains of any of this is um, a couple of stone pillars behind the dam and then the dam itself. And then at the lower end of the Hinkley Reservoir, the, the Prospect Pond, the area below the dam, there's a couple of foundations of old structures that either um, existed prior to the dam or during construction of the dam. This is an image of the Hinkley Dam when it was finally complete and the reservoir was backing up behind it. This is um, from the South Shore. And as you can see, it's April in this image. You can still see snow in the hills. When, uh, when the water first went over the dam for the very first time, the villagers, it was written about in the newspapers, who were fleeing, like running back in their homes, sort of in fear because they didn't trust that this giant dam was going to be able to um, hold the water back and that everything would be flooded. The first time the water went over the dam was 1915, which is coincidentally, um, if you're into Adirondack history, the same year that uh, Adirondack French Louis, the famous um, hermit, died. Right around the same time, too, actually, it was the springtime, and French Louis died in late winter, early spring. So that dam is held up for more than 100 years. So that, those are all the images I have for you guys tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for looking. I hope you enjoyed the images. And I hope that you learned a little bit about Remsen's history and Hinkley's history and Suban's history um, in the process. So if you guys do have any questions, I'd be happy to um, discuss them.